Good morning, everyone, to the second day of the ECB Forum on Investment and Growth in Advanced Economies. Yesterday's contributions have been extremely lively, interesting. There were debates until late in the evening. And so today we'll continue in the same vein, but we'll shift to business cycles, growth, and macroeconomic policy. Before I give the floor to Yves Mersch, I would like to quickly do a couple of housekeepings and remind you of certain things. So in terms of media, all sessions will be live webcast, therefore on the record and can be reported upon live. And as yesterday, any conversations here off, uh, on the site will be off the record. At the risk of repeating myself, please take the opportunity to go and see the posters on displays on your way to the coffee break more back. I've just seen the president speaking to, uh, to various students. And we have quite a time limit on the voting. It's today at lunchtime. Um, so please make sure you cast them. I also wanted to add something related to donations. Um, we were all moved by what happened, and the president announced um, that we will make a financial donation to the causes in Portugal. We've selected two, the solidarity concert Juntos por Todos, that was held last night. It actually already raised over a million. And the funds will be handed over to Niao das Misericordias Portuguesas, who are actively working for the victims um, in the affected areas. And the second one, the second donation will be for the Liga Portuguesa de Bomberos, which is the Portuguese National Fire Brigade. Um, and you need to know that 90% of, um, of the firefighters in Portugal are voluntary. So we'd like to join up efforts. We will send you an email to your iPads. We will send you emails um, to your email addresses. And therefore, we hope that we can contribute and match what others are doing and therefore show with our financial support and do whatever we can. And now the floor is for Yves who will chair the second session on business cycles, growth, and macroeconomic policy. And as yesterday, after the presentation of the papers um, and the discussions, you will have the possibility to ask questions and with that, without further ado, over to you, Eve. Good morning, everyone, on this beautiful rainy day. After such a long period of drought, and um, I have the difficult part to maintain the very high bar that was put yesterday by the discussion. And I'm convinced that uh, we uh, will have as interesting uh, discussion round today with the quality of um, the speakers on this panel. And uh, in order to ensure it, let me also say that uh, the interaction with the public uh, has been extremely positive uh, yesterday. And um, I am also determined uh, to give the floor and the word to the public again today. And that's the reason why I would uh, also tell you that I will be very strict uh, on the timing uh, that is allocated to our speakers. And. Um, we have uh, today, I don't look at anyone in particular. <laughs> <laughs> we have today uh, a very distinguished uh, panel. We will discuss um, business cycles, growth uh, in interaction with uh, macroeconomic policy and also in particular monetary policy. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we have uh, asked for two papers. The first one, uh, which will be presented uh, by Bob Hall, uh, is on sources and mechanism of stagnation <coughs> and impaired growth. And the, uh, it will be, afterwards, it will be discussed uh, exactly the same procedure as uh, yesterday. And I would say same procedure as last year. And um, the second paper will be growth and complementarity between structure reforms and macroeconomic policy. And uh, both papers have in common that uh, we, I think, uh, will address the issue, are we in a prolonged recession? Are we in a kind of, st is still secular stagnation a word to be used? Uh, but in any case, uh, how do we see the interaction uh, 
uh, with uh, growth and low innovation and productivity, with uh, hysteresis effects, uh, saving investment imbalances. Uh, we also, I think, will discuss uh, the uh, debt overhang, how it still interacts, um, the reduction in the working age populations in our advanced economies. And then finally, um, I think uh, one important element is also the inequality and political uncertainties um, that to some extent have a little bit diminished in Europe, but they're still pervasive uh, at the global level. So um, I don't want to make a long introduction. Uh, let me immediately uh, start with the um, first paper that will be presented uh, by Bob Paul. Uh, let me tell you that uh, he is uh, the senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And um, he was also a member of the National Presidential Advisory Committee on Productivity in the US. His uh, paper uh, will be discussed by Goethe Egertsen, who is a professor at uh, Brown University and who has worked uh, at research departments uh, in the IMF uh, from, 22, from 2002 to 2004 and afterwards for a long stint also at the Fed New York until 2012. The main focus of Goethe's work is the analysis of monetary and fiscal policy over the business cycle. So please, Bob, could you make the start? OK. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I. Only two weeks ago, I was at the conference of the Central Bank of uh, Portugal. There couldn't be a bigger difference in one respect. The, in the directions for that uh, event, it says dress code colon. There is no dress code. <laughs> um, now, I couldn't help noticing the contrast between what I thought was quite a downbeat uh, message from Chairman Bernanke uh, in the opening dinner, uh, and then a much more optimistic uh, view about Europe from uh, President Draghi uh, yesterday, uh, sufficient to elevate the euro by several percentage points. I don't think I've ever been president when a market ever moved before. Um, the, but I think I'm in re what you'll see here today is more on the Bernanke side. Uh, ben was uh, talking mainly about uh, the particularly bad things that are happening at the bottom of the earnings distribution uh, in the US. I'm going to talk about something which uh, is, uh, I think, an important part of that story, which is even the average worker in the US and other economies uh, has not done very well, not so much from uh, the uh, crisis, although that had an immediate uh, and powerful short-run effect. but. I'm going to talk more about the longer run effects that really came into play in the US and other countries around the year 2000. Um, one, of the th one of the themes of the work that I've done recently, which is cited in this paper, is that uh, the, although the US had a bad recession uh, starting at the end of 2008, um, it was only a typically bad recession. It was about as bad as the 1982 recession. Uh, uh, and the U.S. economy bounced back from it uh, rel about a, at about a normal speed. The real problem in the U.S. was that it was superimposed on longer-run adverse developments, especially with respect to earnings, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and, and, uh, and those adverse uh, developments began uh, well before the crisis. Uh, and in the, in the paper that by the way, it just came out as a National Bureau working paper. I and three other authors developed that theme, I hope convincingly. If not convincingly, at least at great length. Uh, and so I invite you to, to take a look at that, which is now uh, available uh, in this, uh, effectively its published form. OK, so uh, I'm going to talk about stagnation. Uh, stagnation is thought to be yesterday's issue. Larry Summers made a big deal out of this uh, uh, now almost four years ago. Um, and I think generally sort of stopped talking about it because 
both in Europe and the U.S. We've seen a movement uh, in the U.S.'s case back to full employment and in, in some European countries as well, but at least a lot of progress uh, in Europe. And so talk of stagnation has somewhat died down with uh, fairly good, uh, by recent standards, growth. Um, but, but in fact, uh, we, we know that uh, the crisis uh, worsened the stagnation. One of the things I'll show you is uh, how much of that stagnation was already underway before the crisis uh, in many countries. Uh, so, so I think it's still appropriate to talk about stagnation. Um, and stagnation is not just a, a factor that affects uh, people at the bottom of the income distribution. I'm going to talk about national averages, which are uh, something that can be documented from national income accounts. Uh, but, but you should think of that as one of the moments of a distribution of earnings. Uh, and in the US, at least, the widening of the distribution, which has continued, uh, makes this uh, the fact that it's mean, the, the growth of the mean uh, has dramatically slowed down, as, uh, amounts to stagnation, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the, the measure that I'm going to uh, talk about today uh, and focus on and decompose uh, is real labor earnings per member of the population. It's not a number that uh, has, gets a lot of attention. Um, uh, it's a very comprehensive number in the sense that uh, by earnings I mean uh, compensation, so it includes fringe benefits. Uh, it's the national income accounts are one of the best ways to understand how much of earnings today in a modern economy comes in kind from employers and not uh, directly in cash. Um, it's not nearly as bad a number as Chairman Bernanke mentioned that he said, quoted this number, which I think is somewhat misleading, that uh, there has been no increase in mean earnings or median earnings um, uh, since 1980. That's, in the numbers we're talking about here, there was quite substantial growth uh, in the time prior to uh, recently, and in fact, it started growing again. Um, I think it's a very useful number to look at because uh, in most advanced countries, most people do not have very much non-labor earnings. So, so, so the average person uh, is consuming based on earnings alone. Uh, so, and that's important because of the fact that in a number of countries, as I'll show you, the share of national income going to earnings uh, has declined. That's particularly true in the US, but it's also true in some other countries, not all uh, countries. So, so I'm going to look at a number which is a little bit unfamiliar, uh, but I think uh, actually is the single number that, that captures the kind of things that I want to talk about. As soon as uh, Larry Summers launched the discussion of stagnation, uh, we realized, well, how do you measure stagnation? And I think an answer, uh, real earnings per member of the population. Notice that it's not, particularly not, real earnings per worker, because a lot of the changes that have occurred uh, in the US and other economies is the fraction of uh, the population that's at work. So I want to sweep that into this calculation. Uh, numbers based on just looking at workers don't convey, certainly in the case of the US, don't convey some of the really important things that have happened with respect to labor supply. Uh, okay, so I've talked about that. Um, so here's the, here's the results uh, of these calculations. Now, these numbers come from the harmonized accounting system of the OECD. Um, by the way, this is my first venture into, uh, it's throughout my career absolutely been a governing principle of my career that I study only the U.S. economy on the grounds that the U.S. economy is uh, sufficiently complicated to occupy at least a career. Um, but uh, for this group, it seemed to me that uh, having developed this accounting system and, and sort of thought through these issues with respect to the US, which I've done in a number of earlier papers, including one I just mentioned, um, this is just translating those calculations. But if you start asking me details about any country but the US, you'll embarrass me. So. Uh, I refer you to the OECD, for better or worse, uh, for uh, the documentation of, of these numbers. So, so the bottom line of this uh, analysis in terms of uh, macroeconomics is that 
macroeconomics is way more complicated and hard than you think. Uh, and the reason for that conclusion is that the, the economies, the six economies that I'm looking at, which are identified uh, here, are all advanced economies. They all have access to the same technology. They all have economies that are organized along the same principles of a mixture of, of government activity, and, but mostly relying on the production side on private activity. Um, they were subject to a worldwide financial shock in 2008. Everything ought to be the same. All these economies, by everything we teach, um, in terms of how there are random shocks impinging and go through an impulse response function, the, the orthodoxy of modern macro, when you feed the same shocks into, into the same model uh, with the same impulse response functions, you get exactly the same results, right? But that's not the way things work, as you can see from this picture. So these, this is the outcome variable that, that I'm interested in. Um, and uh, it's divided evenly between pre-crisis uh, and post-crisis, seven years pre-crisis, seven years post-crisis. Um, and you can see the effect of the crisis almost everywhere uh, uh, as a decline uh, in 2008, 2009. Um, but uh, the pre-crisis development, one of the things that I didn't realize is that Germany was stagnated pre-crisis and the crisis energized Germany and German earnings have risen much faster post-crisis than pre-crisis. Who'd have thunk? Um, so, so that's kind of a surprise. Um, maybe a little less surprising is that the performance of, of Britain, uh, which was very good pre-crisis, uh, was at least average so that by the end of the period, uh, the growth over the 14-year total period, 15-year total period, uh, was, uh, was at the top. Uh, the U.S. is uh, not so great. The, notice that the U.S. had the biggest uh, shock effect. Um, and that's because, as you'll see, uh, the, the rise in unemployment in the U.S. was higher than uh, other countries. And this shows the importance of keeping track of the fact that when there's fewer people working, average earnings per member of the population will decline. And that's uh, particularly important for the U.S., where unemployment is a particularly... Um, volatile, mean-reverting uh, variable. OK, so this is what we're going to try to untangle. Um, to untangle that, I'm going to do uh, something that comes very naturally to me, because Robert M. Solo was my thesis advisor at MIT. Um, and he had recently, this tells you how long ago I was in graduate school, he had recently come up with this completely ingenious idea, which has is, which is really dominated macro measurement ever since of log linearizing the production function uh, and then observing that you could measure the elasticities as factor shares. So that gave a completely transparent way of thinking about how a set of macro variables uh, interact and give rise. Now, in his case, the outcome variable was just output. So he just log linearized the production function directly. I'm going to do something a little different because it's going to be talking about real earnings rather than output. Uh, but philosophically, this is what uh, Solo taught us. And so things like this are almost always identified with Solo as a Solo decomposition. So the first thing is that uh, real earnings, the outcome variable that I'm interested in, is by definition the labor share times some measure of real output. Uh, now you can get into the details, but it turns out not in terms of these uh, log changes that we're going to focus on here, it's not a uh, we don't need to measure. It doesn't really matter exactly how you measure real output. Uh, what, however you measure it, you want this to hold as an identity, so you're going to have a corresponding way of measuring the share. A lot of these things I write down, are, there's no behavior here. These are all identities. Uh, uh, and uh, the behavior is just reflected uh, in, in the decomposition. So we'll, we'll get to economics at a certain point. Right now, we're just talking about identities. Um, OK, so then real output is the output per unit of labor input times the volume of labor input. So this is going to be a labor productivity uh, uh, exercise. Of course, it's going to be driven by total factor or multi-factor productivity. But uh, I'm going to state it in a form which is often used in growth theory, which is to state things in terms of uh, 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 per unit of labor input. Um, so 
so that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, now, here's one thing. You have to read the appendix of this paper uh, to understand this, but output per unit of labor input uh, depends on multi-factor productivity with a, with a power, uh, and you can look in the, uh, you look on the last page of the paper, which is in your iPad to see that, um, uh, and, um, and also a function of the capital output ratio. So this is gonna enable me to, to talk about the effect of capital accumulation or, and, or the slowdown in capital accumulation as a determinative factor, but normalizing by the level of output. And that's quite instructive. I think that's a, that's a useful thing to do. Um, and then finally, we can break down the volume of labor input. And this is where the most original parts of this work uh, occur, not that it's breathtakingly original. Um, into hours per worker, workers per member of the labor force, which uh, captures unemployment, members of the labor force per person of the working age, which is labor force participation, uh, and finally, the people of working age is a fraction of the total population, which is, measures the dependency ratio, and that's an important factor, and it varies across uh, the countries we're looking at. Um, okay, so, so this gives rise to a seven-way breakdown. So there are seven different things to think about uh, in understanding uh, the, the issues of stagnation. First, I mentioned for the labor share. Second, productivity measured uh, solo's way, that is as multi-factor, or, or I don't know why this is, but in the US it's called total factor productivity, TFP. But in Europe it's called multi-factor. Um, uh, the capital output ratio I just talked about, uh, hours per worker, uh, uh, the employment rate, which is just one minus the unemployment rate, to keep it in the same sign as a measure of, of a positive measure of the amount of work that people are doing. Um, uh, the ratio of the labor force to the working age population and the ratio of the working age population to the population of all ages. The last, by the way, over this period is actually not very important. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty steady trend. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but the others are all, we'll get to the economics as soon as we start talking about uh, each of these. Um, Okay, then just to summarize in a table, uh, the findings that were also shown in that, in that picture, which is the uh, growth rates of real compensation per member of the population, now averaged over the, the seven years uh, pre-crisis and the seven years uh, post-crisis, you can just, again, see the heterogeneity uh, in responses. And basically, these six countries arranged in alphabetical order fall naturally into groups. Don't ask me why, but uh, the alphabet helps here. Uh, so France and Germany uh, resemble each other in having uh, low or even slightly negative, in Germany's case, uh, performance uh, pre-crisis, and definitely leading the pack uh, in terms of post-crisis performance, uh, measured by uh, this measure. Uh, then the second two, Italy and Spain, um, have uh, better pre-crisis performance, but uh, post-crisis, these appear to be countries, at least on a timing basis, where there was a tremendous swing uh, toward negative uh, performance measured by, uh, by this measure. And then finally, uh, the two so-called Anglo-Saxon countries, uh, uh, Britain and the US, uh, had pretty good pre-crisis performance, They're very good in the case of the UK, and somewhat negative uh, uh, post-crisis uh, performance. Um, so again, you can see these uh, closely similar economies uh, give very different results. Uh, and uh, I, I can, I, this breakdown I think is gonna help people think about this, but believe me, I don't have all the answers here by any means. Uh, obviously, I know much more about the US, so my discussion of, of these will, will tilt toward the, the US. Um, okay, so labor share. Uh, this is now suddenly the hot topic in quantitative macro uh, in the U.S. and it should be, should be in, in Europe as well. Germany is the standout in which uh, the shares, labor share has actually been slowly rising throughout this period, just completely, completely smooth behavior. In all the other five countries, especially Spain, uh, you see the a plunge uh, in the labor share. Um, well, again, the heterogeneity is an interesting uh, question. Um, so quite a few papers have been written. 
several of which I've been called the referee, called upon the referee, by the way. So uh, I've acquired, I haven't written on this subject, but I've been paying a lot of attention to, uh, to the evidence. Um, and it seems that the topic that we talked about yesterday, uh, um, which is uh, the, the, of the various things that might affect the labor share. But, you know, first of all, Solo taught us uh, that we probably ought to think about the labor share uh, as kind of a constant. You know, in other words, Cobb, under Cobb Douglas, lots of things that you would think would affect the labor share don't affect it. That's one of the first things to understand uh, because uh, with unit elasticity, Cobb Douglas technology, then you get an exact offsetting of things that would normally change the share. So you can't think about, well, did wages rise relative to the cost of capital? That shouldn't affect the labor share at all under Cobb Douglas. And Cobb Douglas seems to be a pretty good approximation. Um, the factor uh, that, that we, I think we need to focus on uh, is the role of changes in the price marginal cost ratio. The price marginal cost ratio in industrial organization economics uh, is a, a um, uh, is a measure of market power, but is market power very generally described? For example, in monopolistic competition, uh, you have market power, even though we think that, that there's zero uh, profit available to the marginal entrant. Uh, so it's not as if there were barriers to entry or, or conspiracy, but still there is market power. Um, so uh, that's an idea that, that has been pushed pretty hard. Uh, by quite a number of authors uh, in, the, in the US with respect to this decline in, in the uh, labor share, which is one of the three big factors we're gonna see, labor share, uh, productivity, and, and uh, at least in the case of the US, uh, participation. Um, uh, but of course, it's heterogeneous. Why should it be so much bigger in Spain? Uh, as, uh, Spain isn't the headquarters of high marginal cost price cost ratio companies like Google. Uh, marginal cost at Google is essentially zero. Uh, so they have infinite marginal cost, price marginal cost ratio. Uh, but Spain is the country where you see the biggest change. Now that I think is, is something that we ought to be looking at. Then you see these cluster of, of countries and you see Germany uh, just sailing along with uh, slightly rising. Um, I think probably the productivity uh, uh, data are, are well known to everybody. Uh, that is, productivity growth has been terrible in all these countries. We, we see it as kind of a crisis in the US. There's a lot of discussion of why earnings growth has been so low in the US. Say, so how can it be we have a very tight labor market? We have extraordinarily, uh, uh, it's extraordinarily difficult for an employer to find a worker in the US today. Uh, that by the measure, that measure of duration to finding a new worker, the U.S. labor market is tighter than it's ever been. The number of people who have just entered unemployment as a fraction of the labor force in the U.S. since we kept records since 1948 is lower than it's ever been. We have the tightest labor market you can imagine. Not that far after this terrible recession. Um, but, but it's not driving uh, earnings growth. Uh, and the reason it's not writing, writing, driving earnings growth is that productivity growth is low. That's left out of many accounts. But you can, you can see, even though it's the best over this whole period, it's been very low uh, since in the post-crisis period. But we can't find any evidence that it's the result of the crisis. That, that we looked into in this paper that I mentioned before. Um, and then other countries, the UK, which is a strong performer by most measures, uh, by, by productivity growth, is terrible. Um, so this is, this is, in some ways, the central problem of modern capitalism, is that we just can't get any productivity growth anymore. What lies in the future is, is not something that I'm going to get into, but uh, uh, this is just shocking relative to uh, the earlier record, especially uh, in the US. Um, uh, the capital output ratio, there's, there has been uh, uh, a, a lot of discussion of the shortfall of investment, but the shortfall of output is so much higher than the shortfall of investment uh, that uh, the decline in output relative to the capital stock, which is a slow moving state variable, has actually raised, the, the crisis increased the capital output ratio, saturated the economies in capital because of the decline in output. And that decline comes from all the other 
factors, that I, adverse factors that I've talked about. Um, so, uh, so you can see that uh, there's no country where uh, the capital output ratio plunged because of lack of investment, even though investment uh, uh, was, um, uh, was relatively weak uh, for the different reasons we learned about yesterday. Um, uh, Okay, weekly hours per worker is not, not a big factor. It's much more volatile in the US, as this shows. Um, it's much more likely that uh, workers will work short hours in the US than other economies, but uh, between beginning and end, uh, this is actually not a big factor, so I won't dwell on it. Um, the employment rate of the labor force uh, is how unemployment gets into the story, and it's, uh, and it's really important. Um, and it's often a neglected. If we look only at per worker, then we leave out this critical point. And you can see that in the high unemployment uh, uh, country of the whole group, which is Spain, um, uh, it's a very meaningful. Notice that all these pictures I'm showing you, the vol vertical axis is the same, and these are all additive factors. I didn't mention that before, but uh, you can see that this and productivity, uh, in terms of short-run fluctuations, uh, keeping track of unemployment, which is something that is not done in most analyses, believe it or not. We talk about the importance of unemployment, but then we ignore it uh, uh, when we do these calculations. And labor force participation, uh, only the US has had this collapse of labor force participation, which is the result, which is now the topic of a, of a very large literature. Um, but uh, it's very specific to the US. I, I won't go into that now for want of time. Uh, and I mentioned that's nothing, I'll skip that. So conclusions. Unitary theories of stagnation are unhelpful. Don't buy Hansen, don't buy, I won't mention other names, uh, uh, because it's, no unitary theory works. Uh, you gotta pay attention to what actually is happening separately in each of these uh, six countries. Um, and I guess, so another factor is that it seems like the zero lower bound is not such a big deal. Uh, several of these, um, Countries have escaped the zero lower bound, but they haven't escaped it to stagnation. Um, and uh, so, uh, so each, each country has its own story. Uh, uh, and I was asked to talk about policy, but anticipating I wrote out of time, I'll just say one thing, and that is that financial fragility was a big contributor to at least the short run effects of the crisis. We do need to work very hard on developing more robust financial systems. We'll avoid the short run problems, but we'll still have to live with a variety of longer run problems. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the heterogeneity of results in these uh, uh, economies uh, stunned me, even though I knew it was gonna get something like this, but the amount of it is just quite striking. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. And thank you for respecting your time as well. Uh, I will now hand over immediately uh, to Goiti and uh, to discuss this very focused, labor market focused uh, analysis by Bob. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here to uh, discuss this paper that uh, I found very interesting. So uh, this is how I'm gonna organize my discussion. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about what I consider as sort of uh, stylized facts that, that Hall presented in, in his framework. There are gonna be two of them. So in macro, I just realized recently that stylized fact is a term invented by macroeconomists, in particular Kaldor. And that's because we don't really have facts, we have just tendencies. There's always an exception, uh, Germany in this case. And then I'm gonna talk about the core of, 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 of the paper, which is the, what I call Hall's decomposition, which I think is a very useful way of looking at the data, and namely decomposing the increase in real income into seven different factors. And I'm gonna present it slightly differently than, than, than uh, Bob did, uh, in a way I hope is useful. So uh, then of course I'm gonna uh, talk about interpretation, and here I'm gonna uh, separate paths with Hall and, suggest Bob and suggest that unitary theories are gonna be very helpful to understand what is going on. Uh, let's mention Hansen, but we can mention all the names. And, and then emphasize some uh, disagreements. 
So the two stylized facts that, that Hall uh, emphasized, and this is the picture uh, uh, he uh, uh, showed us, I'm going to show in a second. Uh, the fact number one is that the Great Recession marked a fall in income uh, uh, per capita. Uh, and, you know, uh, and this year is the, or the income per member of the population. It has been falling uh, or uh, growing slower ever since uh, the crisis. And I'm putting a line here in the crisis. This is just the figure that Bob showed us. And I guess one of the things that uh, 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 Bob emphasized here was that uh, the performance of these countries are, are very different, uh, which he suggested uh, might be uh, uh, means that no unitary theory is useful to think about this. I suppose I'm going to, my theme is going to be somewhat counter to that. In fact, I'm going to suggest that perhaps it's useful to think of all of these countries as having been subject to a crisis shock or a fall in the natural rate of interest. Uh, the key difference is that Germany was subject in a, to a differential way to uh, the other uh, countries that were part of the uh, European uh, Monetary Union. Uh, so for some reason here, uh, the, uh, okay. Back here. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so Germany was differentially affected than these uh, other countries that are part of the monetary union, and then the United Kingdom and the United States had, had their own uh, monetary policies. And a key difference here uh, that in, in the reaction of these economies uh, can be seen by uh, the way in which they adjusted labor inputs appears to be different, and I'm going to emphasize that fact. Uh, and so there seem to be some difference in labor market institutions that uh, uh, may be useful to think about this figure and the differential effects. But bottom line, stylized fact number one, there seems to have been this market decline in uh, real income per member of the population that is uh, uh, really marked by, by the crisis. Stylized fact number two, and again, Germany is the odd man out, uh, that a large part of this can be explained in the, in the fall in the share of income that goes to labor. This is the labor share, and we can see here, particularly Spain, uh, uh, she's a market decline in labor share, but we see this across all countries except Germany. Now, one thing that is a little bit of a puzzle to me relative uh, to the, what we saw uh, yesterday was that there we saw some evidence that labor share had also been falling in, in Germany, but perhaps that was because the, the sample period was longer, but that's something certainly that would be worth uh, looking further into. Okay, and then here you see that this fall is sort of uh, uh, starts uh, to become more severe right around the crisis. So how can we account for this drop in income per member of the population? And the key thing in this, uh, in this paper is to propose a simple and very useful accounting framework which is sort of akin to growth accounting, but has much more details in decomposing the labor input and allow for time varying uh, factor shares. So let me just briefly give you a little bit of a feel for what, what it is doing here. So the key uh, innovation here relative to the typical growth accounting is to go into a lot more detail in the volume of labor input, what I'm calling, calling LT here. In particular, so you know, where does LT come from? Well, it comes from the population, uh, big NT, right? <laughs> But then there's only a fraction of that population that is of working age, which is age T over NT, and a fraction of that that are member of the uh, labor force. So that's the, uh, 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 and then a labor force participation. Then those that participate in the labor force, not all of them are employed. So that's this uh, term. And, and then finally, uh, those who are in fact employed there may be changes over time in the number of hours they work per week. So this is a very useful way to think about it, to decompose the labor input into these uh, different, four different margins. And that's precisely what uh, Bob does. And then, uh, 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 then he also takes account of the share of income that goes to labor. And if we take a Cobb-Douglas production function, that would be given by alpha here. Finally, the volume of capital you can also uh, take account on. And finally, uh, TFP, which I guess uh, we should put multi-factor for the deal here in Europe, but I'm used to call it TFP. Okay, so that's just a simple production function and giving a sense of where, where, what the kind of decomposition is that he's doing. Uh, and then, you know, at the, at, the, at the core of it, though, is, is looking at uh, the uh, income uh, 
that goes to labor, or let's say log of L, uh, alpha with the shear that goes to labor income over yt over uh, the population. And one of the very nice thing about what, and I'm gonna, uh, this is just to sh uh, preview to you how I'm gonna present his decomposition. Uh, so let's say that this is the income per growth member of the population in a certain period. What he can do then, and what he does, and it was perhaps not as apparent because he was uh, uh, showing you all the countries before each component at a time. Let's think of a single country that grows by this blue bar. You can decompose that into growth in the working age to total population, labor force participation, employment rate. Now this of course could also be negative, hours per worker, capital output, and finally TFP. And all of the, the point is all of these bar, bars should sum up to the big one, right? So it's a very useful way of doing this decomposition. So let's take a look at how this looks for uh, these different countries that, that Bob was looking at. Okay, so this here shows uh, United States and the red here shows you the fall in income uh, from uh, 2007 and to 2014, while the blue shows you the increase in income from 2000 to 2007, and then it is decomposed in these different uh, factors uh, below. So what we can see here is that the uh, large part of this, what I would emphasize, I guess, is that a large part of this can be uh, really explained why it has not been increasing as much in 2007 to 2014 is this decline in labor force participation. So that's the green bar, the very negative green bar, no, I mean the red bar. The other thing is that you see a fall in TFP relative to the blue, right? And finally, you see that the labor share has declined here in, in the case of the US. So I would say two, I guess, three main factors, volume of labor as measured by labor force participation, decline in labor share, and then a fall in TFP uh, is the story in the US. In Spain, uh, you also see that there's a big decline in the volume of labor, but there is not showing up in labor force participation, but instead the employment rate, and to some extent, hours workers. But again, a second element to that story is uh, the fall in the labor share. Total factor producti productivity here is not doing a whole lot, uh, nor is, is, is capital output. In Italy, you get, the, again, the same story that the volume of labor is falling, and here it is the combination of employment rate and hours worked, and then finally the labor share, and again, here you don't see much in uh, the TFP is playing a lot smaller role. Okay. And you can see here the scale is bigger, the fall is much bigger in Italy. Uh, France, uh, you see somewhat similar picture, although the fall there is, is, is smaller in real income over that latter period. The red is, uh, uh, is minus one. But again, here you see the volume of labor is falling, and it's the employment rate in hours per worker that is falling, and then again, the labor share. So you see, do see commonalities here, fall in, in labor inputs and uh, labor share. The key difference is which measure of labor input is falling, okay? Odd man out here, though, is the United Kingdom. There, what seems to be entirely driving it see, appears to be uh, TFP. The, the, the fifth odd man out is Germany, where you don't even see any fall in income whatsoever. So uh, let me just uh, uh, move on from there. So, okay, so what have we learned? I think there's a bunch of stuff we have learned here that is interesting. First, what is not the story? Aging here is not the story, right? Contribution of working age to total population, not important to explain the drop in income per population, but I mean, that is one narrative that has been popular for people to explain the stagnation. That's not playing a role here. Another thing that is interesting here is that lack of investment is not the story. Uh, contribution is very small, and that comes directly out of this decomposition, and it's interesting. And uh, there are some that have argued that uh, financial friction was holding back investment, and that is driving, that this is suggesting to us that it's not uh, that important. Now finally, uh, it's hard to tell any coherent story with total factor productivity. It's all over the map in these countries, okay? So what is the story? Well, the story I would suggest is that in most countries, Frank, Italy, Spain, there is a drop in labor input via employment rate and hours worked. In the US, this shows up as via drop in labor participation. The key, key question then is, what is, uh, does the drop in labor input, why does it show up differently in the US versus the European countries? Uh, Bob has suggested that the, in, in this paper he referred to that the, the, the fall in, uh, labor force participation is unrelated to the crisis, I'm very skeptical 
of that. And if, if it did in the US, why didn't it do it in these other countries? I think a more reasonable interpretation is that there was a demand shock, labor input fell across all these economies, but they did so in a different uh, way because they have different labor market institutions. But I think that's a key question to ask here, why did they show up differently? What is the story? Well, there is all uh, these countries, except for Germany, show a market drop in labor share, violating sort of a classic Caldor stylized fact. And I guess one key question is, what is driving the drop in labor share? And I think there was a very interesting discussion here yesterday. Uh, I have th had thought of this uh, as being just due to an increase in monopoly power in the US, but it looks like this is a phenomenon that is also taking place in Europe, and it's much harder to tell that story in Europe, apparently, at least according to the talks we heard yesterday. So then the question is, what is explaining it, if not uh, increase in monopoly power? Or it, it cannot be the only story if that, has, if that development has not been happening in Europe. Okay, so peculiar number one, that the TFP, rather than change in labor input, is driving the UK, UK slowdown in income growth. Uh, drop in labor share still uh, there. Uh, peculiar number two, Germany. Well, what's new, so <laughs> not dwell on that. Uh, uh, but I think that perhaps is because they were not uh, affected as strongly by the financial shock, shock for for whatever reason. Uh, uh, so the bottom line here is that uh, nowhere is lack of capital formation a big deal, nowhere is aging a big deal, uh, labor share falling across the board. In Spain, Italy, France, the labor, uh, the labor income stagnation also shows up in uh, labor input, while in the UK the productivity seems to be the main culprit, uh, and Germany no stagnation. Let's now talk a little bit in the two minutes I've left, a little bit about interpretations. Uh, one thing I think uh, uh, I find a little odd about, uh, and he didn't really, Bob didn't speak too much about it, uh, is that uh, this notion that uh, uh, insufficient demand would have to show up only we have one, one measure of labor input, namely the employment rate. I see no reason why you wouldn't expect a low demand showing up, for example, in participation or hours work. Uh, and and uh, so I think that's... Uh, uh, so, in, and that has been my theme here, perhaps labor rationing is simply happening via different mechanisms across the countries depending on the labor market institution. I also see no reason why demand shocks cannot show, show up in total factor productivity. In fact, there's one of the papers here of, of the young uh, economist that is modeling exactly that channel where it works through innovations. And, uh, uh, you know, that's the hysteresis effect and even uh, uh, Bernanke suggested another hysteresis uh, mechanism in his talk, if I understood him right, which is essentially the financial crisis got people out of uh, work and they became addicted to opioids. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty classic uh, a hysteresis effect where you permanently scar the labor force, uh, force with uh, unemployment. So, bottom line, I don't see anything here uh, in the result that suggests that a slowdown is not driven by demand. And uh, 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 now, does that matter? Well, it matters because uh, if you say that that is not driving it, you sort of give uh, monetary pol policy a free pass, which I think would be a mistake, is especially here in Europe. Uh, and it also, it sort of uh, ignores the obvious thing that these countries have in common, so, which is that, so what would you have expected in a demand-driven recession? Well, you would have expected that uh, interest rate would be low, inflation below target, and then an output gap. I, I suggest to you that we have seen all three things in the countries in question. And there's nothing that says that that output gap needed to show up in, in XT. So I'm out of time. Uh, very interesting decomposition. My interpretation is somewhat different. Uh, I don't think we know exactly what the source of this is, but I think this paper gives a very valuable tool, tool via this simple decomposition. Thank you. Thank you, Goiti. I think now it would be fair uh, to ask Bob whether he wants to have a short reaction, um, not beyond five minutes, uh, oh. because we also... I get five minutes? <laughs> maximum, <laughs> maximum uh, no, to no. react to the statement of Gauti and his uh, questions. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for uh, a very insightful summary of the paper, so I, uh, which I have no fault. Uh, I think on this question of... I think you accused me of of demoting demand policy, uh, and I realized, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get into it in this discussion, but I realized that's right, 
uh, it does seem to point in the direction uh, that demand effects and therefore demand policy, which is something that's normally within our grasp and still is with fiscal policy if we're not completely uh, unable to exercise fiscal policy. Um, I, I'm inclined in that direction. Uh, I recognize that, that the evidence here is not uh, dispositive. Um, one of the things you mentioned is that there's no reason in principle why uh, demand wouldn't enter the determination of labor force participation, but uh, that's something I have studied very carefully in the U.S. Um, and there I think the evidence is, is almost completely persuasive. Uh, the decline in participation began before the crisis, was, was well underway uh, by uh, 2008. Um, the, you, if you look in the participation numbers, there's a, there's a little bit of a sign of, of, the, of the recession itself. Um, but then, so unemployment rose rapidly and then declined pretty rapidly. Uh, participation just continued downward. There's the, the fact that participation continued downward at the time that the labor market was tightening and has now reached an unprecedented degree of tightness, um, I think pretty much knocks out for the U.S. Um, now, I, I certainly agree with what you said, that labor market institutions uh, are going to be part of the answer to this, and, and there's a very, very large literature on that point, which, which I think uh, would support that. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, given, given first of all, the importance of, of, of uh, factor, total, total factor productivity uh, and very little evidence uh, supporting the demand theory, there are recent papers that suggest, that support the demand theory, but they don't, to me, they don't survive just staring at the, at the time series evidence. Uh, uh, there's not historically been, say in the U.S., not much of a correlation. In particular, uh, if you look at the timing of, of TFP measures uh, in the U.S., they go exactly the wrong way for a theory that they're demand-induced. Uh, it was exactly when demand seemed to be falling most rapidly when, when we had the most satisfactory uh, uh, TFP growth, and then when the economy began to recover, TFP growth fell. So the timing just doesn't fit together. Uh, I am afraid that we're going to have to face up to the fact that of the volatility of, of output or real earnings in this case, um, uh, demand is not that big a deal uh, if you look at, say, two to three year changes. Um, they're dominated by TFP, not by demand. Um, that's a point that I've been pushing for a long time. I, I, I wrote a extremely badly received uh, Jackson Hole paper in 2005 that pushed that point very hard, but uh, a very distinguished Harvard economist got up and said, everything is wrong in this paper, and he sat down, uh, <laughs> carried the day. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I, I recognize that I probably haven't prevailed on that point, but uh, it would, this is particularly in the U.S., where the U.S. economy traditionally has bounced back on the demand side quite rapidly. Unemployment in the U.S., unlike uh, continental Europe, is a very strongly mean reverting variable. There's, there's a well-known paper by Blanchard and Summers that made that point long ago, and it's, it's exactly true today. Um, so, so at least in the U.S., uh, even, even when imprisoned by the zero lower bound, uh, unemployment melts away in a way that is quite convincing that what's happening is that the economy's returning to normal in terms of demand-supply relationships. Uh, and zero, zero to support any theory of hysteresis. Um, the recent Brookings paper looks very, very hard at hysteresis and comes up with nothing. So, so you know, it was a great idea, but uh, you know, it doesn't seem to show up in the data. I think, I reckon this will be part of our discussion. Uh, certainly uh, quite interesting to see whether uh, the Demand components uh, were uh, not responsible uh, for the Great Recession, and uh, what would then be also the appropriate uh, monetary uh, policy uh, in response. But uh, I think also the disentanglement of cyclical and structural factors uh, have a role to play. Let me now turn to our second uh, paper, and uh, this paper is uh, called 
growth and the complementarity between structural reforms and macroeconomic policy. It will be introduced by Philippe Baguion, who is professor at the Collège de France and uh, also at London School of Economics. Uh, he is a fellow of the Econometric Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Philippe has received numerous prizes uh, as well, and uh, his uh, introduction of 25 minutes uh, will be followed uh, by a discussion to, that will be Chad Jones, who has uh, done important research uh, on long-run economic growth. And uh, he is a professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, and also he has been a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And uh, he also has received uh, distinguished rewards in the past. So let's start with Philippe uh, and his introduction. Do you, do you want me to do 25 in a go or 20 and then five or whatever? OK, <laughs> we, we'll see. No, that's, OK, that, that, I, 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 I go. Hesitate. I, I, will, I get going. I will okay. cut the oxygen after okay. 20 minutes. <laughs> Sorry? Just 25. Oh, yes, 25. You, okay. you have it in front so, of you um, on, on the so thanks very much. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, Enis Karoubi, who is here from uh, BIS, and Emmanuel Fari. And I think I have to make the disclaimer that uh, none of what I will say are the views of BIS as such, OK? Particularly uh, the title. No, I don't know. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so of course, there is this big issue. Why is Europe less resilient than, uh, than the US? Why is it that uh, following the recent uh, big financial crisis, uh, you know, Europe had more sluggish growth than the US? So there's been various, you know, uh, uh, explanations uh, put forward. For example, my friend uh, Jean Pisani Ferry, who is not uh, here today but was on the program, uh, you know, emphasized the fact that the sequence, the policy sequencing in Europe was suboptimal compared to the one in the US following the crisis. Uh, other people have said, well, more, more fundamentally, there are two things that you have in the US that you don't, that you don't have in some European countries, uh, starting with my, with my own, uh, uh, is a lack of, uh, is, is particularly is the failure to implement structural reforms. Uh, uh, and also, people have blamed, uh, at the European level, a lack of reactivity in macroeconomic policy compared to uh, compare to um, uh, US. So uh, uh, in 2014, Mario Draghi uh, pointed to the uh, complementarity between proactive uh, monetary policy on the one hand and structural reforms on labor and product markets on the other hand. He said, there is that much I can do. But on the other hand, uh, countries have to do their homework and they have to do structural reform. In particular, my own country has to decide to do serious structural reforms. So uh, here I will focus on product market competition, and we argue that there is complementarity in inducing more growth between uh, a more proactive monetary policy, a monetary policy that reacts to the business cycle more, and a more competitive environment. Okay? So that's, uh, that's what we are trying to do here. So uh, there is first a model, which I will not uh, inflige, uh, uh, which I will not impose on you, but the first part of the paper is a formal model. In, uh, uh, in our model, you have an economy where firms can make growth-enhancing investment, but they are subject to liquidity shocks. To survive liquidity shocks, they need to reinvest in their project uh, at the interim period, but, the, but anticipating that they might face liquidity shocks and therefore have to reinvest, uh, 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 they, they may want to hold some liquidity uh, uh, to start with, to, to, have, uh, to do less uh, reinvestment uh, exposed, you see what I mean? So, so they may have to sacrifice because they may want to make sure that they have enough to reinvest at the interim period. So what you do is that when you know you face liquidity shock, you tend to hold liquidity to not invest all your liquidities in the first place because you want to make sure that if you have reinvestment needs you, uh, uh, with your uh, profits plus the, the hoarded liquidity, you have enough to reinvest and continue the project, okay? Uh, uh, so a main, uh, a, a main prediction of this is that, of course, a, a, a more counter-cyclical interest rate, particular lower interest rate in recessions, uh, would reduce the amount liquid firm, of liquidity firms need to hold to wither liquidity shocks. Okay? And so uh, the pre prediction that come out of that model is first that the more likely liquidity shock, the more growth enhancing uh, uh, it is to have a more counter-cyclical interest rate. 
but, uh, but, uh, but uh, particularly when you have high competition. Because when you have low competition, firms make low rents, make high rents. So when they have high rents, they can always use these rents to reinvest. But when you have high competition, there is less rents that you can use at the interim period to reinvest. And therefore, you need to hold more liquidity. And that's where a more counter-cyclical uh, interest rate would help firms. You see what I mean? That's, the, that's where the interaction between uh, uh, interest rate and competition, uh, uh, cyclicality and competition plays, OK? So, uh, uh, so the, to, to test this, we, we do the following. We will use a difference-in-difference difference approach comparing pre versus post OMT industry growth in a sample of euro area countries. We relate the change in growth uh, uh, be, be, to the unexpected change in 10 year government bond yields between pre OMT and post OMT. The announcement of OMT lowered uh, uh, the, the yields, the bond yields, and, and stimulated growth. You see what I mean? That's the idea. So, the results to summarize is the unexpected drop in government yields following uh, OMT had a positive effect on growth but in sectors with higher pre-existing indebtedness. Of course, it's sectors that are indebted or are more likely to face liquidity shocks that are affected by the, by the decrease in bond yield induced by the OMT. But all the more, uh, but, all the, but only in countries with low market product market regulation where you have high competition. So we see this interaction between product market competition and the OMT policy. Okay? So it's twice a tribute to Draghi. First, the idea of the complementarity and the OMT. So it's, uh, voilà. Uh, uh, so, uh, and pre-existing levels of indebtedness as, as a drag on growth, the more so in countries with high, uh, uh, with low product market regulation, which means with high degree of competition. I, I, I watch the time. Huh? So why look at before uh, I get dehydrated. Why look at before versus uh, uh, after OMT announcement? Because we are interested more generally in the effect of monetary policy on growth. But of course, this raises always an endogeneity issue. You may, are you capturing the effect of cutting interest rate in bad times on growth? Or are you capturing the fact that it's easier for fast growing countries to have a more counter cyclical policy? So, how do we address this endogeneity issue? Is we look at OMT as the ECB response to the Euro European sovereign debt crisis, and we look at the, unexpect, at the effect of the unexpected change in government bond yields following the announcement of OMT. And it's the effect of that thing on growth that we are looking at. Okay? So some historical context, uh, over 2011-2012, uh, some major euro area countries faced severe spikes in government bond yields, raising prospect of sovereign default. Then the OMT program was a commitment by the European Central Bank to buy government debt under some strict conditionality. OMT was targeted at relatively short maturity bonds, yet its announcement was followed by massive change, as we will see, in long-term bond yields beyond and above what has been expected. And what we are using is the unexpected part, you see, uh, uh, the, the, the forecast error, the effect of the forecast error in the long-term long uh, bond yields. So we measure the unexpected component in bond yields by the forecast error defined as the difference between the realized bond yield in a, a quarter Q of your Y and the forecasted bond yield for that quarter at the end of the previous year. And we average over quarters for any given year. And what we do is to compute the, the change in the forecast error, in the average forecast error over quarters between the period 2011-2012 and the period 2013-2014, pre-OMT, post-OMT. Okay? So we look at how OMT changed the forecast error okay? in long-term bond yield. Okay, so what you can see here, I don't know if you see very clearly, but you have the, the blue bars and the red bars, okay? So the, the, red, the red line is the forecast error in the policy rate, in the three months interest rate, which is the, 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 the policy instrument. But what's interesting is the blue bars, those are the forecast error in the 10-year yields. And what you can see is that for Spain and Italy, you see before the uh, uh, OMT, uh, uh, you, you see you have... Uh, the long-term rate were above the forecasted rate. You see what I mean? You were, uh, uh, things were worse than what you expected. But, but then after the OMT, it's the other way around. The long-term rates are way below the forecast uh, levels. You see, you have a decrease. You see the forecast, the, the, the real goes below the forecast, okay? So there is a, 
a, a drop in the ionic you see in, the, in this uh, uh, in this uh, forecasted area you, you can see that in, in Spain and Italy and those are countries where you have high level of debts you have a, a highly indebted and, and uh, if you take if you take for example uh, other countries like uh, uh, you see here you, of course the, the raise uh, you see the, the the fact that you have above forecast uh, long, uh, long term uh, yields before was due to the European sovereign debt crisis. And then for the, the, the dotted line is the OMT, and then the OMT changes things. Then after that, it goes the other way around. You have uh, the realization goes below forecast. Okay? So there is a dramatic effect of, of the announced OMT. But if you look at other countries, for France and Germany, which were not in so dramatic debt problem, you don't, you don't see the same effect, you see? Okay, if you look at the US and UK, you don't see the same effect. So it's particularly important in countries where indebtedness was high, okay? So, uh, uh, so now I can look also at unemployment. Spain, uh, uh, unemployment was above forecast, uh, uh, you know, when you had the, uh, the sovereign debt crisis before the OMT, but after the OMT, unemployment goes below forecast, okay? And same in Italy. If you look now at growth, so the, the, you see uh, uh, what you see now. The red line, the red line is the, the, the GDP, the, the error in GDP. Uh, uh, the red line is uh, um, is, the, is the growth, uh, the, 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 the error in growth forecast. And what you see is that prior to the OMT, the true growth would be would would, would go be, you know more and more below the forecast. But you see that the the movement. Okay, and that's, uh, that's true for Spain and, and Italy, but particularly for Spain. Okay, so, uh, uh, so now what I want to do is to look, I know that OMT has an effect on, on the long-term bond yields. I saw that this has effect on growth, on employment, but I want to know how the, the, the effect, uh, how this interacts with product market regulation. Okay, so what I will do there is that I look at product market regulation. You can see, I have nine minutes left, huh? So you see between France, of course, we have the highest product regulation in France. You know, uh, visit France, it's a very lovely country. There is a lot to do there. <laughs> but, Emmanuel, but with Emmanuel, I'm very optimistic. Okay, I should not say that. That's not the view of the BIS. Okay, so the... <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, and what's very interesting also is to look at the right-hand side, because the right-hand side, you have the various components of product market regulation, and a very interesting one is the, is, the, is, the, is the green one. You see that the, the but you see barrier to, uh, the, in particular, you see the barrier to uh, trade and investment are particularly high in, uh, in uh, uh, the barrier to trade and investment are particularly high in Spain, Belgium, and France, and less so in Germany, Portugal, Austria, and Italy. And we'll see that this plays a big role later on, the, bar the barrier to trade and investment, okay? Which are a good measure of product market competition. So I get back to those later. So remember Spain, Belgium, and France, high barrier to trade and investment compared to the other countries. Okay, so now what are the, I have eight minutes left, okay? So I look at the time. Uh, um, so uh, what, uh, what is my main regression? My main regression is to, regree, is to, uh, is to regress the, uh, the, 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 you see the, um, the, the growth, you see the, the, the forecast error on growth post uh, in 12 to 14. On, on, its, on the forcast error uh, uh, in, in, in 10-12 for countries and sectors, S denotes sector, C country, okay? So it's cross country, cross sector. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the beta, the beta, I have a, uh, uh, yeah, of course the pointer, the, the beta D0, that's the coefficient on the indebtedness, and I expect that beta D0 should be, uh, should be negative. That means existing debt reduces investment in, and growth. I mean, it's clear. Uh, but what's interesting is the, is the interaction with the, the change in the forecast error following the OMT. And in fact, I expect that beta C0 should be positive. That means that the more indebted you are, the more uh, uh, the, 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 low, the lowering of the long-term long bond yield following OMT should boost your investment and growth. You, you see what I mean? And uh, uh, that's the first equation. What we do in the second equation is to add the interaction with product market regulation. 
So you have the, uh, uh, so you see the term, you add the interaction term with product market regression. The beta D1 should be positive. It means that that reduces investment and growth, less so when you have high monopoly rents. Less so when you have low competition. Because when you have low competition, you can use your interim profits to refinance yourself and investment. You see what I mean? So, but on the other hand, of course, when you have more product market competition, uh, uh, the, you, you see the, when you have, uh, uh, the, 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 then the beta C1 tells you that a decrease in bond yield will boost your investment uh, uh, and growth, but less so when you have more product market regulation. Okay, that's why the beta PMR is product market regulation, is the, an in, the inverse of product market competition. Okay, so now let me show you, I have five minutes left, this result. So uh, what you see, if you look at the second row, first you see the second row is the beta, uh, uh, is, the beta is the interaction between sectoral indebtedness and unexpected dump in yield. And you see that the, you see the more indebted you are, the more growth, be it value-added growth or labor market productivity growth or capital productivity growth, the more those guys benefit from a drop in yield following OMT. But now you go to the third row, and what the third row shows you is the, is the, is the triple interaction with uh, when you add product market regulation. And you see that, so what the, the third row tells you is that when you have a drop in yield, it boosts investment and growth when you are more indebted, but less so in, if your sector has higher product market regulation, less so if there is more monopoly power in your sector. And that's the complementarity between the monetary policy and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, product market co uh, competition, okay? So uh, I want to, I skip, I, I go fast there. Uh, uh, um, then what you can look is you can look at the transmission channel. You can say, well, why, why is uh, the, the lower bond yield help firms? Because it will reduce their interest payment in particular. So here what we do is to do exactly the same exercise, but instead of regressing the growth, we, re we regress the interest payment. Instead of regressing growth or investment, we regress the interest payment. And what we see, in fact, is that uh, uh, <coughs> you see the second row there uh, will tell you that uh, uh, you see uh, the, the lowering of the yield following OMT will reduce interest payment all the more in more indebted sectors. That makes sense. But the third row tells you that uh, we, that will do less, less so when you have higher monopoly rents. Uh, the lower yield will, will reduce interest payment, but to a lesser extent if you have more monopoly power. Okay? So conclusions. The main result, we looked at the effect of unexpected drop in long-term government bonds following the announcement of OMT. We found that heavily indebted sectors benefited disproportionately from the unexpected drop in long-term government yield following OMT, but only in countries with low index of product market regulation. In other words, with countries with higher degree of product market competition. So what are the next steps in this research? Is to look not only at product market, but look at labor market. We want to redo, to take as an interactor, product uh, labor market regulation. You know that in France now we are engaged in a, in a big re uh, labor market reform that will be key to uh, save the world, okay? Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so that's the thing, that, that's one thing we want to do. But the second thing, here I use sectoral data. But in fact, what we want to do is to use firm level data. And the whole problem is to match firms and to have firm level measure of credit constraint. And for that, you need to, to, to match firms and banks. So Shodorov, Gabriel Shodorov has done that for a subset of firms in the US. We have comprehensive firm level data, and we just got the permission to match. You know, in France, you are very good, but you need to get permission from various institutions. And each time, they change the director. So when you get the green light from one, they change the director of the other one. You see what I mean? And so you need periods where you have two remaining directors. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it takes for very long. Otherwise, I would have shown you the firm level results, but I couldn't, but because that's what I am aiming at, OK? So, mm, so what I will do later, but I think that I do later, so you tell me you are the boss. Should I talk about the other thing? Because after, since Chad will talk about something else, what I, what I was about to say was one response to Chad. But I think you should be, I think it's relevant for central bankers, is to explain to you that we don't know how to measure TFP growth, and, uh, because we don't, and we don't know how to measure aggregate inflation. And I think it's, I guess it's relevant to this assembly, and I would like to have five minutes to explain why. But do you want me to do it now or to do it after Chad? No, no, no. Let's first. Uh, let's have Chad first. Let's have Chad so first. So that you can rest a bit. Yeah. 
Because Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> okay, but I, I want Good to job. thank Philip also <laughs> for the, the high amount of discipline uh, of his presentation and respecting the time. So you have a very difficult uh, role now to discuss uh, all the messages that we have received. Wonderful. Well, it's uh, certainly a pleasure to, uh, to be here and participate in this session. Um, uh, the paper that Philippe just presented is a, is a classic Agion paper. It's, uh, it's ambitious, it's provocative, and it ingeniously address, addresses a, a fundamental issue um, of importance to the ECB and, and, and many other uh, economies. Um, as I considered my remarks, I appreciated the fact that I'm uh, surely the least knowledgeable person in, the, in this esteemed group um, concerning monetary policy and OMT and the effects of OMT. And so that left me with a conundrum. Um, I realized I had a comparative disadvantage in commenting on uh, Philippe's presentation. Uh, so with apologies to Philippe and his co-author, I took the second alternative that the organizers offered me and that is to provide my own perspective on the topic of our, of our session, um, growth in advanced economies. And in particular, I want to think about this question of uh, how do we understand what accounts for the slow productivity growth that we've seen uh, in the United States and Europe in the last 15 years. So uh, that'll be the, the thrust of my remarks. Um, I want to begin by uh, just reviewing the basic facts very quickly. You're familiar with them, and we've seen some of them today. Um, my remarks are going to basically say, what is, what is the recent growth literature? How does that help inform us about the sources of the productivity slowdown? So I'm going to review the theory briefly and then discuss the evidence from, from the recent literature uh, and then conclude with prospects for the future. Okay, so uh, this first graph is, is one that uh, I'm sure is familiar to you, but it, still I thought it was helpful to look at the evidence. So I'll start with the U.S. and then I'll show you the, the European TFP growth on the next slide. Um, first we have... Um, private business sector total factor productivity growth. And you can see, um, you know, from 1990 to 2003, growth was uh, uh, fairly strong at 1.2%, and then it fell by 40% in the second half of this period uh, to 0.7%. So that's a, sort of a, a, a useful summary of the productivity slowdown, the slowdown in growth in the United States. Um, a, a question that's commonly been raised in, in the literature is to what extent can mismeasurement account for this. So, um, you know, the, the, the rise of Google and Facebook and the, the free stuff that we all, we all receive, um, does, d surely there's some mismeasurement there, and can that mismeasurement explain uh, some of the slowdown? I think the answer is yes, and Philippe will comment uh, to some extent on, on the extent to which mismeasurement can, uh, can help. On the other hand, we know mismeasurement's not the whole story. So there's been recent work by uh, Chad Severson, uh, John Fernald, and other people arguing that mismeasurement's not the whole story. And, and my version of that, I guess, I found interesting to look at the manufacturing sector, where we, we think things are relatively well measured and where, you know, at least arguably, a lot of the uh, Facebook, Google uh, innovations aren't necessarily uh, impinging strongly on this sector. And the, the striking thing there is you see the productivity slowdown is much, much more dramatic. Um, as we saw yesterday, this was the rapidly growing sector uh, historically, so 1.6% growth in the first half of this period. In the second half, productivity basically stagnated completely, so a growth rate of 0.2%. So really dramatic productivity slowdown. So uh, how do we understand this fact is going to be the, the first question. Then extending the analysis to Europe, um, uh, this shows you total factor productivity in the U.S. again, and then uh, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. Uh, these numbers are from the, the Penn World Table's uh, latest database. And, you know, you just see that the slowdown is even more striking in, in Europe. So uh, Germany shows uh, slower productivity growth in the U.S. since 2000. Uh, but basically, France, Italy, and Spain all have productivity levels that are essentially lower than they were in 2000. Uh, France maybe 2% lower, Spain maybe 5% lower, and Italy maybe, you know, more than 10% lower. And so um, it's not just enough to explain why is productivity growth slowed. But at least in many of these economies, productivity growth has been negative for a long period of time. And that, that provides a particular challenge, I think, um, uh, to, to understand. Okay, growth theory offers uh, two basic uh, ways to understand uh, the determinants of TFP. Um, the first are these idea growth models that Philippe pioneered along with uh, Peter Howitt and Paul Romer. Um, 
And if we want to understand slowing productivity or, or maybe a decline in productivity, I think the decline in productivity the idea-based models are, are less helpful for. But certainly for slowing productivity, uh, we might think about it as, as coming potentially from two sources. First, it could be harder to find new ideas. Maybe there's something um, with the production function for new ideas that says it's getting harder. This is something that, that Bob Gordon's uh, emphasized. Um, second, it could be we're, we're looking less intensively. So maybe we're just not looking as hard for new ideas as we used to be. So the inputs could be, could, could be not performing as well. Um, so idea-based growth models is one sort of way to get a handle on TFP. Um, the other theory we have is misallocation. Um, and this is uh, something that's been appreciated uh, uh, more in the last decade than ever before. And I think it's one of the important contributions of the growth literature in the last decade. It's associated with uh, Restuccia and Rogerson and Shea and Klino. And, and the basic idea, which is very clever, is that misallocation, the misallocation of resources, of capital and labor or other inputs, misallocation at the micro level, when you aggregate up, shows up as low TFP at the macro level. So TFP is about how are you using your capital and labor in the aggregate. You've got a certain amount of capital, you've got a certain amount of labor. Well, if that stuff is misallocated at the micro level, that means the economy is less efficient and it shows up as aggregate TFP. And so misallocation, I think, provides a particularly uh, useful way to get a handle on declines in TFP because rising misallocation would reduce the level of TFP. And so that, that's, a, that's a particularly useful uh, insight for possibly explaining some of the, the weak performance that we've seen in productivity. Um, so those are the two, the two theories that I want to explore, and I'll, I'll take them in turn. Uh, so first, the evidence um, on ideas. <clears throat> um, so, so, so this slide draws on some recent work I've done with uh, Nick Bloom, John Van Rien, and, and Michael Webb. Um, and the basic idea of this project is to apply the solo growth accounting methodology to the idea production function, okay? And, and what we find kind of everywhere we look is that ideas, and in particular, I guess, the exponential growth that results from the discovery of new ideas um, are getting harder to find. Exponential growth is getting harder to achieve, okay? And the way to, the way to start to understand this is with the equation in the middle of this slide. Um, virtually all idea-based growth models rely on an equation like this where economic growth driven by the discovery of new ideas is on the left-hand side. It's produced by the discovery of new ideas. And on the right-hand side, we see that where does growth come from? Well, it comes from uh, research effort multiplied by the productivity of those researchers. Okay, and so I want to use this kind of a equation as an accounting framework to understand where our growth is coming from and whether what's happening to idea TFP. Um, essentially, it's, it's a solo exercise. We can measure growth rates reasonably well. We can measure research reasonably well. And so we recover TFP in the idea production function as the residual from applying this equation. Okay, and we've done this in a bunch of different places. Um, I did this long ago for the aggregate economy, uh, for the U.S. economy. And there you know that growth rates you know, over long periods of time are relatively stable. If anything, they've been declining recently. Um, what about research effort? Research effort is rising enormously in the U.S. economy. So if you go back to the 1930s, uh, the U.S. economy today has roughly 20 times more research effort than it did in the 1930s. Well, if you combine that with stable or declining growth rates and enormous rises in research effort, you see that, you know, by definition in some sense, idea TFP has to be falling dramatically. And we find that, you know, since the 1930s, um, it's roughly 20 or 25 times harder to generate the exponential growth through research uh, you know, today than it was in the 1930s. Um, what we do in this new paper is apply this methodology everywhere we can at the micro level to see what's going on with sort of, you know, uh, detailed innovations. So we look at Moore's Law, we look at agricultural productivity, you know, the uh, production of uh, wheat, cotton, soybeans, and corn. We look at various metal medical innovations, so pharmaceutical innovation, uh, mortality associated with cancer or heart disease. Um, and we look at firm level data from CompuStat. So a, a, a very diverse range of sources um, that involve you know, different data measurement issues uh, and things along those lines. And the robust finding we find everywhere we look is that you know, idea TFP is falling quite dramatically. So my favorite example of this comes from Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, as you know, is, is this statement that um, the density of computer chips has been doubling every two years for much of the last half century. And since the doubling time is constant, that corresponds to a constant exponential growth rate. 
um, some, a growth rate of like 35% per year, so really rapid growth. Well, how has that growth been achieved? How has that stable growth been achieved? Not surprisingly, it's been achieved by throwing more and more resources at the problem. So the number of researchers looking for ideas related to Moore's Law has grown tremendously. In fact, you know, one way to summarize this is to say it's essentially 75 times harder today to generate that doubling of computer chip density than it was in the 1970s. So, so to, to conclude this slide, I mean, basically what we find is everywhere we look, ideas are getting harder to find. The interesting thing, though, with respect to today's conversation is we find that's always been true. That was true in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1950s and the 1960s. It's always been getting harder and harder to find ideas, and so we've been throwing more resources at the problem to generate the exponential growth. We don't find any significant evidence, I would say, that something changed in 2000, that it's even harder today than it was in the 1990s. And so I actually think um, there's a lot to this story that ideas are getting harder to find, but at least when we've looked at the evidence, we haven't found that this is a source of the slowdown in productivity since 2000, okay? Um, one other thing I want to draw your attention to on this equation while I've got the, the slide up is that the number of researchers rising is the key to offsetting declining idea TFP to get productivity growth in the economy. And so it, I, I think of this as the red queen model of economic growth. You have to run faster and faster to maintain the same constant growth rate. And if we ever slow down our running, that would slow down growth. And so that's what I want to turn to next. What, what's happening on the input side? Let me skip this slide and, and go here. This shows you research employment, R&D employment, in select economies. And one thing to appreciate is that you know, the productivity growth in the US or in Portugal depends on ideas created everywhere. So you want to look at the worldwide inputs, not just you know, researchers in Portugal or researchers in the United States. And so I've got a, a collection of economies here. You could see the interesting thing is the input growth Research input growth has slowed down. So in the EU, it's, it's the smallest slowdown, say from 3.7 to 3.1. The US has a slowdown of about a third, from 3.2 to 2.1%. And then intriguingly, Japan has a remarkable slowdown that you know, goes back to the 90s in their research effort. And so uh, this at least is suggestive evidence to me that there may be something associated with slowing research effort. Uh, in terms of explaining the slowdown in productivity. And in fact, one of the young economists, uh, Martin de Ritter, uh, suggests that uh, one reason for this after the financial crisis is the interaction between the financial crisis and financial constraints and, and research investment. Um, so that could be part of the story. Okay, let me turn now to evidence on misallocation. Um, I mentioned before that you know, th this misallocation literature, I think, is one of the, the highlights of the growth literature in the last decade. Um, the insight is relatively straightforward. It's that the efficient allocation of resources requires equating the value of the marginal products of inputs across firms. And so you can use dispersion in the marginal product of inputs as a measure of misallocation. And so Shea and Clino and a, a number of follow-up papers have explored this. Um, the, the recent paper by Bills, Clino, and, and Ruan looks at how this has changed over time in the U.S. economy. And, the, and the, the way I've plotted it here is they're asking, uh, relative to full efficiency, to what extent does misallocation reduce efficiency? And the surprising, stunning fact that they, that they document is in the green line, which is if you just apply the Shane Clino methodology to the US economy over time and ask what happens, it looks like misallocation has increased dramatically. The allocation was 2 thirds efficient in the late 1970s, and it's maybe one third efficient by the end of this sample. So an enormous increase in misallocation, which is probably too large to be believed. I know when, when, when uh, these authors saw this finding, they were very puzzled. They looked hard at it, and everyone had worried about measurement error. And so the point of this paper is to develop a correction for measurement error. And they argue that when you correct for measurement error, it looks instead like the top lines. It looks like the US is 80% efficient, and that's sort of stable over time. And so which of these lines is correct, I think, is is still an open question and a very important issue. Um, so to some extent, increasing misallocation could be happening in the US, but, but, but maybe not. Um, what about in European economies? So there's a nice paper by Gita Gopinath, Lucas Kerbobonis, and uh, Sebnam Kalimli Azkan, and uh, Carolina uh, uh, Viegas Sanchez um, that look at Spain in particular, and then they also have some evidence for Italy and, and some other EU countries. And here I'm, sp I'm plotting the, the standard deviation of the log mar marginal revenue product of capital and marginal product of labor, 
And you could see an increase in dispersion, significantly large, maybe a 30% increase in dispersion. And these authors claim that that could lower TFP by 7 to 12% in Spain and by 5 to 15% in Italy. Um, and so this sort of rising misallocation could be an important contributor to slow productivity in Europe. Um, this has been expanded upon by a bunch of papers. Um, let me not go through those in detail. Let me just spend the last minute talking about prospects for the future. Um, on this slide, I guess I would highlight the middle bullet point. I would say that the most optimistic reason I can find to think productivity growth might not uh, be so bad in the future is China and India. Each of these economies by themselves are as large as the US, Europe, and Japan. And so you know, as these economies develop, how many future Edisons and Einsteins are they going to produce who historically haven't been close enough to the frontier to realize their potential, but increasingly are going to contribute to, to the idea uh, frontier? And then on misallocation, I would say there are many open questions here. Um, there's some evidence in these papers that I didn't get a chance to discuss that misallocation across sectors associated with the financial crisis, sort of the too much construction leading up to the crisis, um, might be a, fa a factor uh, of misallocation here. Um, what happens if you apply this mismeasurement correction to the Gopinath et al. results, I think, is an open question. And then finally, what are the fundamental economic forces that are behind this rising misallocation? That's something the growth literature is working on uh, enormously right now, and I hope to be able to report to you uh, some good answers in the future. Let me stop there. Okay. Thank you, Ted. So in, in this very unconventional uh, panel, uh, since we discussed complementarity, I will hand back uh, to uh, Philippe uh, to have uh, the presenter's privilege of a few minutes uh, to make some complimentary remarks. So uh, can I get back my slides? Uh, yeah. I wait for the slides. I can, can you show my slides again? Ah, voilà. OK, excellent. Thank okay. you. Oops. Uh, we are getting there. Huh? Okay. Yeah. One second. OK. So, um, well, thanks, uh, Chad. All these uh, extremely uh, insightful analyses. And uh, so, um, I, I wanted to, uh, but to, to, so that we, we launched the debate, and it's a, it's a big debate on that. Uh, there are several, uh, there is one thing I wanted to, to mention. Uh, very much in relation to what uh, Chad has discussed, for which might be of interest for you know this audience, is uh, we try to make the argument with my colleagues Antonin Bergeau, Timo Bopart, Pete Clino again, same Clino, and Yui Lee, uh, uh, that uh, TFP growth is typically mismeasured. And why is it mismeasured? Because you see, what we know is the monetary values of objects. So we take this glass between yesterday and today. We know the monetary value. If the monetary value has increased, the, number, the price, we know it's pure inflation because the glass has not changed. Suppose I change the glass marginally, OK? I, I, I could, and the monetary value has gone up. I could more or less disentangle what's inflation and what's the real improvement in the glass. But what happens when you have new goods replacing old goods? Then, then we don't know what is inflation and what is not. So what statistical institutes do typically is they use something they call imputation. In, in Europe, we call that extrapolation, because we like to use different words from uh, the Americans. But it's exactly the same, uh, the same thing we do. We miss in the same way in, uh, with different words, OK? So what we do is that for any product category, we use the goods that have not been replaced by new goods, that have not been subject to to calculate the inflation rate on those goods. And then we extrapolate. We say that should apply to the whole product category. And the question is, how much growth are you missing? And you are missing a lot. The more creative destruction you have, the more missing growth you are, the more uh, TFP growth you are missing. And this is a, a suggestive picture. Here I represent, on the vertical horizontal axis, I rank US sectors by the extent of, of, of the creative destruction. Here I measure it by job creative destruction, but you could also measure it by firm churning. And on the vertical axis, you have the correlation between TFP growth and the flow of patents. And you see that the more creative destruction there is in a sector, the lower the correlation between measured TFP growth and the number of patents. I mean, the less innovation is reflected in growth, OK? So that was the, that what started us. And in fact, what we did is that we were able to compute 
uh, in fact, we, and of course, because the more creative destruction you have, the more you rely on imputation. And we screw up when we rely on imputation because typically new goods are better than old goods. So when you do the imputation, you overestimate inflation and you underestimate productivity growth. And you see that's going to be quite dramatic. We find, in fact, we have a method for the whole US economy. And we find, you see, that the, you, see you go from the measured growth, uh, measured TFP growth in the US over this period to true TFP growth. And you see that, in fact, you are adding every year more or less 0.6, 0.7 percentage point of, of TFP growth that we are missing. You see what I mean? So it means that in the US, between one fourth and one third of TFP growth is simply missed by the calculation, OK? And uh, uh, I've done, we've done the same thing for France. And, uh, and uh, uh, we had a lower period. And France also, you have, uh, those are the measures for France. And so you, here you have the US-France comparison. And, uh, uh, but in France, it's dramatic. Because in France, in fact, half of the measure TFP growth is missed. Quoi. Uh, TFP growth is double of what you measure it in France. But because France is, it has low TFP growth, it's not because. Uh, and what's interesting is that this number, in spite of what we call dynamic di dynamism, has not gone down over time. But the missed growth has become a bigger part of total growth because total TFP growth has gone down. So, uh, of course, now, when you talk about inflation targeting, monetary policy, uh, you have to recalculate. Because if we know that we have even less inflation than we say, uh, that, how can that not be of interest uh, to the crowd here in this room? Uh, it should be. Uh, uh, so that's why I think. I, I first, uh, 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 two remarks on, 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 on Chad, which are very interesting. On, we had this discussion yesterday. You find that ideas are harder to find in given sectors. The question is, we may keep finding new sectors where, again, we can have. So maybe we may have decreasing returns to ideas in any sector, but maybe we keep finding new sectors. Those are the questions we were wondering yesterday, and I, I wanted to have your, your, your feedback. And on the misallocation, I think that I was, we were wondering, and that's a discussion I have with uh, Ufuk, uh, Aksigit, and with Gilles Berset at the Bank of France. It could be that the, the, you know, the lowering of bond yield, you know, the, the, ease, the quantity easing or the, the easier monetary policy, which was, had many good aspects to it, maybe also allowed more inefficient firms to remain. You could look at the effects of those on firm dynamics. And it could be that the monetary policy itself had a, it's good to lower interest rate in recession, but maybe there is a downside to do it too long is because you may have an effect on firm dynamics. You may allow less efficient innovators to remain and prevent entry by more efficient innovators. So what would be very interesting, and that would be a way to, to match your part and my part of this, would be to look at how monetary policy, if you maintain low interest rate too long, you, you affect negatively the firm dynamics, and that could be fe feeding back into the misallocation. And that, I think, would be something we said. Sorry, I'm, I'm done. Well, thank you. I'm done, finished. Okay. No uh, more of me. Wow. The <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, this session uh, started slightly uh, behind time, so I don't want to, you to prevent to participate in this discussion. My attempt will be to channel all the energy from Philippe into the audience for this discussion. And uh, I would therefore ask uh, that we take 15 minutes of the coffee break, and uh, maybe that uh, we would then have 20 minutes discussion. So uh, I will uh, call for first round of uh, questions uh, on this side. Uh, please do, as always, uh, present yourself for the convenience of those who don't see you. Volker Wieland, German Council of Economic Experts. Um, coming back mostly to the first two talks, I mean, Robert Hall and Goldie Eckertsen uh, pointed out there was some, something unusual in Germany where the heterogeneity was particularly pronounced. And since we, in our council, keep looking at Germany every year and write a report for the public and for the government, I just wanted to offer some additional comments on that. First of all, if you look at Robert Hall's uh, chart, the change in Germany happened actually in 2005, not in 2007. That's when it kind of starts rising, the measure you looked at, and other measures too. So, you know, in terms of thinking about what's driving it, when we argue, talk about what happened before, what happened in the period before, and uh, that was also quite a different period to some of the other countries you looked at for the euro area. For example, you know, 
in Germany, we had a huge unification boom, real estate boom, which we, are, we took many years to get out of the side effects. So just at the time when Spain was embarking on this real estate boom, uh, we were the sick man of Europe, according to The Economist. And if you look at 2003, 2004, then um, the things that changed at the time in terms of the policy perspective was massive uh, tax reductions. So this is the only major tax reduction that we had in a long time. Uh, labor market reform, uh, and also a very um, a focus of the unions on job security versus versus um, uh, wage. Um, and uh, then if you look at the period afterwards, uh, there's been a change in the structural rate of unemployment. We've really created a low wage sector which massively expanded <laughs> employment, and so from the supply side, created demand, you know, changed the demand conditions in the country. And you have to look at it as a two-sector economy. At the same time, we have a high-wage export sector, um, which didn't grow that much in employment, but uh, certainly grew, and then um, there's some element of luck. You know, we were hit by the recession in terms, in terms of output very strongly, in terms of employment, not much, because they kept on the employment. And uh, we had a, an element of luck, if you think of, you know, there's not just the countries you looked at, but the demand for that export sector came back from Asia, from China, and from California. That's where all the Porsches are, are driving around. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I think summing up, uh, Robert Hall, contrary to Gaudi, emphasized uh, that you really have to look at the supply side. And I think that, you know, if you look at the heterogene heterogeneity in Europe, I think you have ev additional evidence for that. So I think most of what happened in Germany was more driven by the supply side uh, factors. And that, I think that also changes the policy recommendations you could give. In terms of productivity, uh, you have to think of composition effects, which, to, which are part of it. For example, you know, the, of course, productivity stopped growing very much as we increased the size of the low-wage service sector. Right? Because there you don't see much productivity growth. That's only a part of it, but maybe an interesting element. And just my final point, uh, in terms of income inequality, we're still a country with a huge amount of redistribution. So even after those uh, reforms. And so, in fact, income inequality, in spite of after tax and transfers, didn't increase since 2005. Okay. Thank you, Volker. I take some more questions. Please be more concise to take as many questions as possible. I, I just, Michael Berta, Humboldt University, I wanted to pile in also on the German thing. Germany has got different institutions, and what happened in Germany is really exceptional. Bob Hall shows that, and it's interesting to know why. First thing is they increased labor force participation from 60% in the 1980s to just under 80%, and this has been done by increasing part-time work. So looking at earnings per person is going to pick that up in a very interesting way, and it's kind of like work sharing, because total hours in Germany haven't changed much since the 1990s. They've grown a little bit since, the, uh, since 2010, but they've actually been pretty stable. The second thing is that wages have not grown since the mid-2000s. And third, dispersion of wages has gone up. So what Volker was saying about the low-wage sector is exactly right. The question is, why did Germans take up those low-paying wages? And the answer is they had labor market reforms that basically forced them to, like cutting unemployment benefits, duration and replacement rates. So that's the, the key thing, is understanding this, the, it's not really a miracle, it's just basic neoclassical economics working the right way. Thank you. And the third question, Yanis. Thank you. Um, on the first paper, um, if, if the issue is stagnation, uh, why don't you use GDP per head as an index? Um, Okay, if, if you want to measure bargaining power, perhaps um, the labor share is better than uh, real earnings. Um, so if, if you m measure GDP per head, definitely there you will see that investment uh, played, uh, played a huge role in, uh, in the ranking. Um, now, on the discussion, um, I fully agree that, uh, that demand uh, had a role to, 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 to play in all this, uh, especially if you look at GDP per head, I'm not sure that as far as the labor share is concerned, we should ignore investment. I mean, it comes from yesterday's paper, especially the second paper, uh, that uh, the labor share fall implied the operational surplus got up, but it was not invested. So perhaps a virtual uh, question would, uh, would be what would have happened uh, 
if the operational surplus had been investment in the labor share. Thank you. Thank you. I will now uh, ask uh, the first paper discussant uh, and presenter to answer these first three questions. Would you start, Bob? Um, well, okay. I, I think that the, the two remarks about Germany are, are helpful. Uh, and uh, it just illustrates the point that I think to understand a lot of the findings uh, in this kind of a decomposition, you have to know a lot about what was going on in the country. Uh, so, uh, you know, the ideal version of this would have a, one expert from each of the six countries rather than, than one person trying to cover six countries who only knows about one country, which was, in fact, what happened. Uh, so I welcome uh, that kind of explanation. I'm certainly aware that, that Germany had important changes in, in labor market institutions. Uh, on this question of GDP per person, uh, first of all, I would be, be, should be clear that I would think of GDP as a, on the income side, not the product side. Uh, uh, so I don't, think that, I don't think there's any special question about the role of investment. Um, and again, as I explained at the beginning, uh, uh, the, 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 the focus on this is thinking about uh, earnings as the basis for the well-being of uh, most ordinary workers. Uh, uh, obviously, GDP per person is, also, is a very useful thing to know. For example, since GDP is basically the tax base, uh, if you wanted to know what's the scope for redistribution, you'd want to know about GDP per person. I totally agree with that. Uh, but if you had to pick one thing to try to deal with a stagnation issue, which was what I wanted to do, then I think uh, 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 compensation per person is, is a more natural single thing to do. But I'm certainly not against measuring GDP, for sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I have that much to add, but uh, I, I guess I think of uh, I, I, the comments from Germany, I, I guess are well taken. I think of it as uh, having been subject, I guess, to different idiosyncratic shock. And I think it is useful to think about a common monetary union to understand, uh, I mean, Germany needed different things than, than Spain and Italy, and that explains the big divergence. And I think you know, it's important to think in terms of the a monetary union to make sense of that, that. It's harder if you take a purely neoclassical approach like the production function approach that, that Bob had. I guess one puts back on, on the uh, uh, rigidity, I mean, the, the, this notion that the labor market in the U.S. has never been as strong, I guess that does sort of uh, beg the question, why is the inflation not higher? Uh, no, no, because there's no basis in, in theory for the notion that uh, market tightness uh, affects the rate of change of a wage or a price. I mean, that's an idea that seeped into economics. Uh, but has just remarkably little basis. There's no, there's no micro theory that tells you that rates of change depend on, on gaps. That's just something that got into thinking in the post-war period, but it's lacked any meaningful microeconomic foundation. Or put it differently, uh, it's not the case when markets are very strong that uh, the typical seller says, oh, the answer to my problem with strong markets is to raise price. Uh, you know, it may, we have a theory of pricing, uh, a micro theory of pricing that doesn't, doesn't incorporate that at all. It's just something that got pasted into uh, macro. There's a famous, in the 1970 uh, origin of, of sort of modern micro, macro, uh, there's a famous passage I quoted many times saying, it's time to forget P dot is equal to lambda times uh, D minus S and have a real theory. And those of us who believe in that real theory if don't, uh, anyway. I have a new paper with Tom Sargent that elaborates this attack on, on the Phillips curve. So I'll let you take a look at it. Okay, I think this invites for more questions. Uh, over here. So I have a question to Chad Chone's uh, presentation which actually I found very interesting. So uh, this idea of the idea production function where you need to throw more and more people 
uh, in in order to generate the same amount of growth. I was just wondering uh, whether that would not imply that the, uh, the wages or the marginal productivity of an additional worker is actually decreasing and whether that would not imply that the wages in that research sector should uh, uh, decrease over time. I see there are two different forces here. Uh, growth operating on a larger base may partly compensate for that, but what, what's the implication of this theory for wages in that sector? I would be curious to know. Okay, thank you. And then I have Charles uh, Guttard. Much of the analysis, Charles Gotthard, London School of Economics, much of the analysis about European differences relates to real exchange rates, which have been very favorable for Germany and very bad for Italy and Spain. But there was no mention of real exchange rates from, from the speakers. Second question is that the speakers all seem to assume that TFT is an exogenous factor driving wages and earnings. How about reverse causality? When labor is cheap and plentiful and profitability is high, why bother to try and get the last ounce of uh, output from your workers? Can't it be that the problem is that low wages are driving low productivity rather than the reverse? Thank you. And then I still have Philip Lane at the end. The issue of the uh, productivity in the US, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has uh, shown that partly the issue is uh, firms in the US outwardly shifting productivity to overseas locations. So to, for example, contract manufacturing in, in the uh, Far East or uh, uh, tax planning uh, in terms of uh, location of intellectual property elsewhere um, means that maybe, and it can be quite big according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, that the rate of productivity growth in the US is understated. And this is mechanically, uh, the economic incentive to do so is, is pretty strong given the US tax system. Thank you. So we start this time on, should you start? That sure, time? sure, absolutely. Um, so this first question was a, was a great question. If we're, if we're throwing more and more resources at the idea of production function, doesn't that imply that the marginal product of those resources is going down? So wouldn't we see wages going down? And is, is there a problem there? Um, I think there, there are two answers to that question. The first is, um, at the economy-wide level, um, uh, the, the general equilibrium force is basically population growth. So where are we getting the resources economy-wide to throw into this production function? Part of it is that the, the population of the economy is growing. The growth in the population provides the demand as well. And so the growth in population provides the supply. The growth in the population provides the demand. And so in general equilibrium models, the wage of researchers grows along with the wage of, of workers. And there's no, there's no problem there. Everything's in line. Um, when you look at the micro evidence, I think new forces get, can, can be involved. So for example, with Moore's Law, we're clearly throwing more and more resources at Moore's Law at a much greater rate than we are in, in, other, in other parts of the economy. Um, and I think that has to be explained by some you know, uh, general purpose technology features of information technology. And so that would provide the, the demand side there. You know, uh, across the sectors, researchers have to have wages that are equated. It's the same misallocation point. And so, um, I think everything hangs together when you look at the general equilibrium model. So, thank you. Okay. Philippe, would you like to come in? No, there's no, no, yes, no. I think Brian. Okay, that allows oh, us oh, for. Wait, wait, wait. Ah, I didn't okay, 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 yeah. okay, Bob, <laughs> come in. Sorry. But, okay, so real exchange rates. Uh, you know, as a, as a student of solos, I have to respect the, the framework. That is, uh, if there's a production function, you can log linearize the production function and, and you can do interesting things. Something like real exchange rates aren't left out of the story, but they're a source of movements of those variables, but they don't shift the relationship. That's, that's the whole idea of, of uh, productivity measurement. So I don't think it's appropriate to say that that framework leaves out real exchange rates. Of course, the, there's, a, there's a whole separate question whether, the, whether trade is properly incorporated. That was the outsourcing question, the last question. Uh, uh, and. Uh, I guess all we can say is that, that doing national income accounting 
uh, with outsourcing is a huge uh, challenge. Um, you can see that in state data, historical state data of the US. By far the most productive state in the United States in 1980 was Puerto Rico. Um, and that's because Puerto Rico was the location of highly productive uh, plants uh, that uh, had been moved there because of a tax advantage. But, and, and therefore, they had all the income, which then translates into productivity, booked in Puerto Rico. But, but it, was in, it, was, it just meant you had to leave Puerto Rico out of your state-by-state -state analysis. Uh, as far as TFP, it's very important to understand this is an, a measurement exercise, not a causation exercise. Um, if just because we measure TFP doesn't mean we're taking it to be exogenous. Um, now, of course, when you start talking about what, a, what accounts for wage growth, then, you, then you're beginning to get into that territory. But the exercise itself is just measurement. Um, so, uh, so then the question is, uh, how accurate is the measurement? Uh, but there's no, there's no taking a log linearization of the production function does not take a stand on, on the exogeny or the endogeny. There's no econometrics in this work. Uh, it's all just log linearization. But that gives it its power. Uh, it's a limited tool, but it, I think it's a pretty powerful tool. But you just have, you have to be careful in interpreting it. Okay, thank you. I will have to close the session. Unfortunately, I have two last short questions. They will be able to be asked, but I don't know if we have time to give answers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two minutes, 35 seconds. First question. Thank you, Francesco Giovanzi. I have a question for Philip. Uh, one of the surprising facts in the graph that Bob showed is uh, uh, France. I mean, France, very stable, resilient, doesn't grow very fast, but it grows very stately, very little volatility. Still, we've seen no reforms. So how can you put the two things together? <laughs> I've been puzzling over that question for decades. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> very Second good question. question. And I also have a question for Philippe. So I was wondering, the countries in your sample, how specific they are in terms of the, of the financial market performance in these countries uh, here? And since your channel always works through financial markets, how much of these coefficients would actually depend on the status of the, would be country specific and depending on the status of the financial markets? And uh, how that would affect actually also looking at the interaction between financial market reforms, um, product market reforms and monetary mm -hmm. policy? Okay, Philip, you have one and a half minutes. <laughs> and so, so it's typically sectors that are more prone, so, so it's countries that are more indebtedness, but also we look into sectors, sectors that are more prone to be uh, financially constrained or liquidity, uh, be to liquidity shock, that are the most affected by the, by the, the combination of the interest rate, and, and of course all the more when they have high competition, you see, when there is high competition in the country. So that's, that's what we, uh, so it's a character, we look at, at that characteristic of the country, but you can look at, characteristic of the sector, so using a kind of Rajan Zingales, say, are, are the sec is the sector more prone to be liquidity constrained? And those, it's for those that, that, it's more, that the thing is more dramatic. So in fact, with the firm level, what would be nice is that we'll have firm level measure of, of credit constraint. That's what we get through the Bank of France. And uh, France, you know, we were, we were mediocre in, uh, in the down and the up. Quoi. And uh, we never go down much, but we slowly decline. Quoi. And uh, that's the dramatic part as well, is because uh, it took time to realize that thing, the, the boat was sinking. When the boat sinks very slowly, you see, don't realize, and at some moment you have to, that moment you have to react. Because the euro, in a sense, is an anesthetic. You see what I mean? Before, you know, in uh, uh, 83, you had uh, to react, and something like that did not happen since then. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think this concludes the session. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Presenters, discussants. Oh, it's great. Coffee break. It's great. Always, no. so you're always so, so limpid. No. <laughs>